So Tom and I got together working with a T&M vendor, and uh, he had this cool project going on and was looking at what we do, which I'll, which I'll get into it. Um, so this presentation, yeah, yeah. So this presentation is kind of a joint, it touches on both a uh, cool platform to run sensing on and the software and technology um, that we're looking into at DeepSig uh, and, and applying you know, AI. And I'm gonna go over that and then we'll transition over to Tom who will talk all about his, his cool new platforms that uh, he, he's been playing with. Um, Right, so uh, bottom line up front slide, this is mainly for folks uh, that get the slides after this. If you read all this now, then it'll be a boring presentation um, because it pretty much goes through everything. The gist of it is, uh, you know, DeepSig develops signal classifiers and, and actually lots of other wireless applications and we apply AI to that. And I'll get into what that means uh, uh, here in a bit. But you can go ahead and go to the next um, slide and probably act actually the, the one after that. Because, um, yeah, yeah. So. What we do at DeepSig, small company, we're in Arlington, Virginia. Um, our background's working in the Department of Defense. Um, most of us are traditional uh, engineers. Like, uh, like you'd mentioned, I, I got my PhD in electrical engineering at University of Kansas uh, under Joe Evans, if you know Joe, and then went to Virginia Tech and worked with um, Jeff Reed there. Um, so a lot of background in DSA and, and wireless and, and software-defined radio development before I went over to the dark side with the government and, and, and hid away for years. Um, so uh, uh, at DeepSig, we are changing things up a little bit. Um, rather than using traditional DSP kind of techniques to do things like um, signal classification or direction finding or even um, things, uh, you know, part of the company is actually pulling out equalizers and channel estimators and 5G base stations and putting neural networks in. Um, we're, we're training neural networks basically to do traditional DSP functions. So, um, and specifically, we're using convolutional neural networks um, to do that and super, supervised learning. So we're taking neural networks and we're training them offline. It's not like some real time, like it's learning while it's running. We're training it offline in what I'm gonna talk about today to identify signals, uh, different signal types. And that line of what we identify is an interesting part that we're talking about. We're, we're talking specifically about the physical layer of a signal. So what you see here is an example of our engineering UI. Um, to kind of just get your head wrapped around of what we're outputting and what we're developing. Um, we're, we're ingesting in wideband RF and we're outputting basically the signal types that are in that wideband RF. So, and we highly leverage SDRs to do that. So go ahead, we'll, we'll go ahead to the next slide. We'll get into it a little more. So, but first the problem and, and the last presentation really set this up well. Um, so uh, in both kind of commercial and defense industry, um, we're seeing, you know, our collection is vastly outpacing what we can process, right? So, I mean, obviously we're not just focused on um, uh, Wi-Fi 6, we're, we're focused on everything, right? Um, although we stay away from the HF band, just to be clear. But, um, and, and, and what we're seeing, and again, both the defense and the commercial world is, you have software-defined radios now that are pumping out 500 megahertz of instantaneous raw IQ. Like, that, that's, that's a lot of data. <laughs> um, and, and you know, this is only getting more and more. The, the, the devices out there that are outputting data are, are just exponentially growing, right? So uh, traditionally, we, we have an analyst or, or, or a single kind of application that's looking at a smaller band and trying to just stare at find interference or, or some sort of specific signal. Um, but now we're really getting into like, you know, you can see 500 meg, uh, one gig of instantaneous bandwidth and, and the, the processing power needed to actually live process everything is just not available like using traditional means. Not only that, but the development workflow for keeping up with all the new signals um, it is not, you know, the, the, using traditional DSP is just not possible to do that. And I'll, I'll touch on that more because to me that's the more interesting piece. So yeah, lots of, lots of new cool platforms out there, which is great. We want to push new SDRs and new hardware um, to, to enable this, but uh, we've got to be able to keep up with the processing piece of this. And, and we haven't seen that, particularly in the defense world even. Uh, you know, the manpower is just staying stagnant while the amount of data coming in is, is growing exponentially. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, so why machine learning? Okay, this, this, is, um, this is a very interesting slide where we always have um, lots of questions and we can debate this afterwards, but um, again, background is kind of traditional DSP, model driven, right? I have a model for a wireless channel. I'm going to write, you know, some sort of capability to detect something or some sort of filter for this specific wireless channel. 
but we know those aren't always perfect, right? Uh, that we try to get them as, as accurate as we can, and we get them pretty close for a lot of different scenarios, um, which, is, which is okay, and it works in a lot of different scenarios um, fairly well. Um, how machine learning works, right, in the image and video world is it's all data-driven, right? So your capability is actually developed from real data. Um, it could be from a data from TNM gear, yes, but it could also be from outdoor, real-world um, data that you've collected, and then you train a neural network and say, in our case, this is LTE, like this is what it looks like. And, and the more data you feed it, right, the, 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 what, uh, the better it gets. Because what's happening is the neural network is actually learning its own signal features, right? You're not hard coding them in some DSP algorithm. Um, it, it's given ground truth data where you've said this is LTE a thousand times and it will learn its own signal features. Could be LTE, could be interference, um, it could be Wi-Fi, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so what you're getting here is actual, because it's learning from the real data, it's taking into account, you know, antenna to antenna, like everything. Um, it, it, could take, it could be taking into account, like, poor performance of the actual SDR you're using, right? Um, it's learning, it can learn, it's, it's going to do the best it can around all the wireless channel effects that it sees, including stuff that's introduced by the radio. So you basically, what we've seen is you eke out uh, a little bit extra performance, depending on, on the amount of data you get it, compared to kind of static traditional techniques. Um, and the more interesting piece of this, and on that last note, when I was with the government, I mean, I could spend a good amount of money and wait a certain amount of time and get a good performance using traditional techniques. What I couldn't get that ML and using AI gives is, is a new workflow of doing this. Because it's a data-driven technique um, and, you're, and you're basically giving this software that's learning um, ground truth data, I don't have to, I'm not relying on the limited pool of electrical engineers out there that are DSP engineers that can write this sort of cap capabilities, right? Um, you know, typically just as an anecdote, like if I wanted a new capability for a signal when I was with the government, I would find some contractor to do it, take a half a million dollars, maybe to a million dollars, I'd wait a year, and then I'd have some great capability um, to deploy. With this, you know, I tell a, a, a less skilled person, go collect data, um, just annotate that data, and feed it into this training routine, and the neural network will learn the signal features. And that, that can happen in a week's time now. Um, and you can add multiple signals to it. So what we're trying to do is address kind of the, one, the manpower problem of all this exponentially, you know, growing amount of signals that we care about, um, be it interference or, or other uh, kind of primary signals of interest. Um, and, and just get that, that cycle quick, like, like shorten that cycle, decrease the cost of, of creating these capabilities to detect and identify um, whatever signals we care about. So that to me is the more interesting part of, of the ML. Yes, the more data you feed it, the better it is, um, but the, the workflow change is, is what I find interesting. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done at DeepSig, trying to stay away, you know, this isn't a marketing spiel, obviously, but I want to give kind of a point of like, okay, here's where we really are with this, right? It's not just, a, you know, we're not just touting AI on a data sheet or something, and it's not really AI. Um, if it's not clear, right, again, we're using AI at the low physical layer for signal classification, so we're not, um, the AI is not teaching the drone how to fly or to fly in swarms or anything like that. We're we are applying it to the low, low physical layer here. So, um, I guess points that we've, we've done. We have done kind of bigger radios that output 500 megahertz of IQ data. Um, and we train a neural network model on that on like 15 different signals. Um, and it can, you know, then that, that radio can then feed live into the neural network and it will live out, you know, output like what's there. Um, we've, we've done all sorts of different signal types. So, um, you know, Part of the hard part for us as a commercial company is to develop a neural network, a custom neural network that is generic to whatever signal types. It's very easy to focus a neural network or our development on wideband signals only that are over, like cellular signals that are 20 megahertz or above, but you know, we, we need to do small narrowband signals, we need to do radar, you know, short pull stuff, we need to do commercial signals obviously, we need to do interference, HDMI leakage. You know, all these things should be able to be trained into this neural network um, in a way that gives us, you know, equivalent performance 
of a signal classifier that is using traditional DSP. So that, that, and that's our burden. That screenshot actually there is of our training software, and that's a um, Lightbridge 2, a UAS downlink and uplink, the little hoppy guys with uplink from the handset. Um, so yes, we, we've, we've, we've hit all sorts of different types of signals. Uh, again, we stay away from the HF band. We've done microwave, VSAT, we've done all sorts of different things. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Right, so, so how this works is we have a bit of software that sits out by the radio, um, typically a software-defined radio, and, and uh, Tom will get into kind of his setup and where that radio is and the host processor and everything. We, we, we typically sit on a, a laptop with a GPU, don't have to have a GPU, but runs a lot faster if you do, um, and that's what we call OmniSig, that's the sensing part. And then like I said, we, we do have some uh, unsupervised training, so that, that sensor that sits out there on the laptop can be retrained for you know, uh, our default kind of setup, it could train, it could, uh, it's trained to detect cellular and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and P25 and, and DMR. Um, but if you have data and you have it annotated, you can retrain a new custom model and push it out to it. And that, that's what I was saying can happen in, in a week's time. Um, and that's usually done, that training is usually done on a bigger server elsewhere. Um, but it could be done on a laptop too. So. We've done, this is just an example of the different kind of deployments that this stuff can run on. Um, you know, neural networks isn't always like giant GPUs, you know, um, and big servers um, hidden away in server rooms. You know, they can run on laptops, on the NVIDIA Jetson platforms, they can run on just an FPGA, they can run on just a small Intel, um, small form factor board. It can, we can feed in data from test and measurement gear, which is how we ran into Tom, right? We can take an Enritsu or a Rode or a Keysight like standard handheld spectrum analyzer, and nowadays these things are pumping off IQ, just like a normal software-defined radio. Um, so we can basically add in a signal classification capability to these tools um, to where people can walk around and not just see the spectrum, but see what it is, like, in immediately. So it's kind of cool. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, this slide's more of just, who all do we work with? This is more of a, um, you know, we make software at DeepSig. We try to work with all these radio hardware vendors, um, right, using standards-based stuff is good, right? Vita 49 is a huge, huge player in this world, and, and um, so making sure that all these different radio vendors um, use close to the same Vita 49 standard, nobody uses the same one, um, but, but it's good, and, and we actually help people kind of value, evaluate that and make sure uh, that their output's validated properly. The output, so what, what do we output, right? We're sitting there instantaneously staring at the spectrum, there's a bunch of signals and in our engineering UI, the user just sees all these, you know, spectrogram basically with boxes around it. Okay, here's some interference, here's a Wi-Fi. Okay, so what? You're just, it's instantaneous. Like, there's also an output that's a common, like, JSON stream, and it's also a specification. It's called sigmf.org, which a variety of government agencies use to represent, basically, um, RF data sets or, or classified output of a, of a sensor. Um, our RF data sets are also in this format, which for machine learning, keep in mind like the RF data sets that you use to train this thing, that's the gold. That's, that's who has that. The better one of those is who wins the game for all this stuff. So building RF data sets is, is really the new writing C code <laughs> and developing you know, your libraries. It, it's putting together RF data sets that are labeled. That's, that's the key, right? Um, so you know, DSP engineers haven't gone away. They're still there. They just have to help label the data. Al although in our world, you know, in the image world, you're manually labeling cat's heads and things like that. In our world, we can actually write digital DMODs to label data for us, because this is all digital data, most of it. Um, so, so we can actually have these mass auto-labelers that help us label data. It's very interesting. Um, right, so we output to Kibana and all sorts of different output things to, to view what we have. These are just some examples of some partners that we work with to display. Um, we aren't display or UI engineers. Um, we're just like writing, you know, machine learning code and, and have to figure out the right way to display it to somebody because it's an enormous amount of data. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so the studio is the training thing. So remember we have out front sensor and then we have something to help, um, help you train or to generate models. And this is the more interesting part that like, you know, when you, get, when you want, literally want to get your hands wet with machine learning, like you play with this. Um, because this allows you to organize your RF data set, to label your data, to train your data. Um, there's, th this, is, this is really where, where the fun happens and where you get folks like the MIT Lincoln Labs and the guys that really want to get into like doing machine learning, uh, start playing with this. So 
Um, right, I kind of already talked about this, but typically this is being ran on a separate server somewhere. All this stuff is really web-based, but you upload your RF snapshots, um, which is a whole problem in itself because they can be massive, right? 500 megahertz, you know, we're talking gigs of data for one second of 500 megahertz uh, sample rate. Um, so managing all that is also a new problem in this world. <laughs> data management. You might have a petabytes of data. How, how do you manage that if you're just a couple software engineers and, and you don't know what the hell's going on? Um, so again, touching on this, this really this is the key piece that lowers the bar for developing capabilities when using AI. Right? It, it's it's collecting data, it's labeling it, and training it. You're lowering the bar. It's less skilled people are, are you know. Uh, can do that. Again, they do have to be able to label it. That, that, that's where you draw the line. You have to be able to either look at a spectrogram or use some other means, or maybe you've take, taken snapshots in a controlled manner, then, then it's very easy. Um, and, and you label those, and then you, you retrain the neural network, and it learns, relearns the new signal features of what you've fed it. What it's learning is a whole other debate. We don't really know that there's large DARPA programs on explainable AI that it tries to figure out what if it's learning some crazy new methodology that we should be implementing <laughs> like in, in traditional DSP um, for power reasons. But it, it's the, the key is it's learning its own signal features. It could be learning autocorrelation values or moments or maybe it's learning a preamble or, or something. But um, who knows? I don't know. That's a tough one for, for kind of folks to, to grasp onto. But. So, um, yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. This is kind of a nice graphic overview of using ML and developing capabilities. I've sort of went through all of this all. You have your RF snapshot database. Again, this is a key piece, right? Um, you want to build a nice RF snapshot database that is diverse, right? I can take LTE captures from my house. Um, LTE is a fairly uh, uh, variable signal, uh, the downlink, right? There's lots of different um, coding and modulation combinations. But if I don't have, you know, a couple different seconds from different areas that I care about, um, then it's basically going to overtrain the network to around my house. If, if you know, because it might only be operating in certain modes around my house. So it's key to to create to get a diverse kind of data set. So, some signals don't change. DMR, for example, or, or kind of push to talk public safety stuff doesn't change too often. So that's you, you you care less about it. And this really gets down to how much data do I need to create a capability, which is another interesting question, and it's somewhat signal dependent. So we label the data. Uh, that pops out a new model file, which is really the weights of the neural network, and then you push that into OniSig sensor, and then magic happens. It starts classifying signals. Um, uh, there is a kind of a ML uh, uh, way of doing unknown signals, so finding out of distribution signals, which is more was very interesting for finding interference. Right? You you know it's not possible to train a neural network to detect everything because uh, you just don't know what's going to be in that band. There might be other weird interference that pops up. It could be a treadmill interference, right? And, and, but it's going to pop up and, and do some damage. But you still want to detect it. Um, so there's a capability to detect unknowns. And then you go back into your workflow here where, okay, any unknown I see, record it, throw it back in here, label it, and now I've got labeled you know, uh, treadmill interference in there. And a week later, I push out a new model, and now it's detecting that. Plus, I can push that out um, to different geographic areas. This is just, again, this is your high-level uh, development workflow for this um, uh, that, that is you know, not specific to DeepSig, but specific to pretty much any ML kind of flow here. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so this kind of touches on after the fact. So I've, I've, I've mentioned this a little bit, but again, we're staring at instantaneous measurements in our kind of algorithm, and it's just spitting out, you know, what's there. Um, actually, how we do it, we take in a small amount of samples. So we take in about two milliseconds of samples, do our detections on that, take in another two milliseconds of samples, do our detection on that, which uh, is nice because we, we need, you know, I could go in the middle of an LTE frame and it will detect it as LTE. I, I could actually be off tune and only see half of the LTE frame in the middle <laughs> and it will still detect it as LTE because, again, the machine learning algorithm is, is detecting its own features and, and it's not doing normal, like, kind of preamble type stuff. So anyways, yeah, so this is an example just to come on a web page. It's like a bunch of OmniSig sensors are feeding into and you can kind of get this high-level view and show me, okay, in the last hour, what did I see? 
Um, you know, this is, there's nothing specific to AIML here. It's just a matter of like, okay, now we're pumping out lots and lots of data. How do we visualize this? What can we do with it? Uh, you know, the Kibana is a nice free tool for viewing lots of data and, and filtering stuff. And this is an example of that. If you go to the next one, you can see uh, um, basically trends and, and different things that we've shown people that they've been interested in. You know, in our office, we've had a spike in Bluetooth um, at 9, 9 p.m. and it's the cleaners coming in. We've done some key fob demos. All this can be viewed in the Kibana stuff, but it, it just goes to show uh, with, with, lot, with, you know, a variety of sensors that are sensing things very fast. And again, this, this guy is scanning, he can scan 100 meg to 4 gig in a few seconds and, and, and not just like show you right, the energy value, but actually tell you what all the signals are. And that's, that goes to the speed, that's when you're running with a GPU. But it goes to the speed and, and, and the ability to take in small time slices and, and classify everything. So you, you really do get an enormous amount of data out of these sensors when you're doing it. And, and they're still kind of in the palm of your hand. Um, yeah, go ahead, go to the next. Okay, so that, We'll pause there for a couple questions on any ML stuff. I know I kind of breezed over this stuff, but uh, um, this will kind of conclude my part and we'll hand it over to Tom and say, okay, what all he's he done with our stuff and other people's stuff, putting it on platforms, what, what is kind of our stuff enabled him to do that he couldn't do before, um, those types of things. But just we'll pause, pause here for any quick questions. We'll have an opportunity, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. As well as, can you compare it against a kind of a typical DSP performance and say it is close, it's better? Yeah. Um, so we do, like, on, with our tools, evaluation is like for this stuff, like, because it's always really cycle. So it's like one of the biggest things is like, okay, you've got a trained thing. Let's see the performance. Oh, this signal's not great. Add more data. You know, so that's constantly going. So our output also includes the confidence value of the detection or classification. So what you'll, what you'll see is um, most of the good detections classifications are flying up around 90% confidence. Um, and if I happen to get an LTE that's like a detection that's like at 60% confident. Okay, it's probably not LTE, but maybe it's an OFDMA based thing. So you can kind of start drawing these conclusions if you're trying to figure out what it is based off of this confidence level. Um, and then in the evaluation side of things, what we have is, um, and again, this gets to the whole ML workflow. You always keep a test set aside, right, that you're not training on. And, and we literally have an evaluation tab on our software where you'll run the test set through your trained model, and it'll give you a confusion matrix um, that basically represents your probability of, of good classification. It'll show false alarms. It'll show your average confidence value. And you can start making some, um, uh, you some you know measurements based off of that of, of what's right, what's wrong, where do I need to put more data? Um, what happened when I introduced this blueberry thing and was it too close to this other one? Do I need to add more data? Diversify it a little more. Um, part of what we do is also augmentation, right? So sure you put in 10 files of LTE, but actually under the hood we're adding noise and fading and all this other stuff too and it turns it into like 100 different files. That's helped us um, diverse, or basically be able to operate in real world environments uh, all over instead of just kind of your local area. So there's a lot of magic also that, that helps with that stuff too. Okay, so the latest in drones for spectrum management. First, uh, Joe, thank you for inviting us to participate in the conference. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, drones and spectrum management, kind of focus on that area. And next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so obviously the advantage of drones is that uh, the altitude gives you a much wider range. Uh, if you look at someone using an antenna at, at six feet and you change that to a drone at 400 feet, you get a eight times increase in the, in the range and obviously the area goes up as well. So the advantage of getting, uh, getting your antenna and your spectrum analyzer or your radio system up in 
up at 400 feet. And by the way, the 400 feet is uh, near near uh, surrounding building or event. If you're at a tower, you can go 400 feet above a tower and maybe get a thousand feet in the air. So you can get a tremendous advantage in uh, in receiving range uh, uh, with with the drone. Next slide. So where do they compare to the alternatives? Of course, airplanes have been around with spectrum analyzers on them for decades. And uh, uh, relative to a drone, it's easier to rotate a drone to do direction finding. Uh, drones now, most drone systems have tethering kits for them. So they can sit in the air for, for hours or days and, and monitor. And uh, the power is sent up from the ground so they, they don't need uh, to have the batteries changed. Helicopter, more, more flexible, you can rotate and do direction finding, but quite expensive to fly and uh, not easy to hover for days. So the drone gives a little bit of advantage and it can sit there for days, have the tether. Man lift is a credible, if you only need to go to 200 feet, it's a credible solution, uh, quite inexpensive. You don't have all the FAA issues, uh, but um, of course, man lift uh, stops at about 200 feet. They're pretty exciting at 200 feet, so 400 feet uh, and on flat ground and a drone, and, and of course, they can go higher above uh, surrounding uh, terrain. So uh, drones have their place, and I think they're now anchored in uh, in what's needed for uh, for spectrum monitoring. Next slide. <laughs> So the big news in the past year, <clears throat> from what I've seen, is that uh, there's a significant move away from Chinese drones. Uh, the drone on the table there is a uh, DJI Matrice 300, very popular uh, public safety drone, a lot of cameras for it, infrared, and and uh, it has a, a 360 degree collision avoidance, so it can, uh, uh, be used to monitor, to, to take pictures of underside of bridges and not go up into the bridge. So it's a quite a quite a nice drone, but uh, but it's being replaced uh, with U.S. drones. I, I now have a Whisper Systems uh, uh, Ranger Pro, and it's the same payload capability, uh, very nice to fly. Uh, the collision avoidance is just a 360 around, not up not up and down like the uh, like, like the DJI. Other companies, Freefly, Autel, there's a whole bunch of new companies that are doing commercial drones. Uh, I worked with a company out of Germany that's doing complete spectrum monitoring systems. So they've already mounted the spectrum analyzer and the antennas and the downlink and all that's been done. And uh, next slide. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing uh, international countries buying these complete systems for, for spectrum monitoring. And the ITUs are starting to accept uh, uh, drones for spectrum spectrum management. So I, I think this is becoming commonplace. Drones are are being anchored in the, uh, the here's what you need to do to get your job done. <clears throat> Excuse me a second. It's getting over cold. So, uh, so here's a good example of what can be done on a drone. Now, this is a complete system that's available from Whisper, which is the, the drone I'm moving to. Uh, there's a small little spectrum analyzer that decodes the uh, 4G and 5G traffic. And uh, uh, so that would allow you to measure the signal strength and identify who the carrier is and, and uh, get a good feeling for what's going, what's around in the environment. So it's a good, powerful solution for 4G, 5G work. Next slide. I do a fair bit of interference hunting and uh, uh, I think we're a slide behind. But interference hunting, so this is the, this is the Whisper Ranger with a directional antenna. Uh, there are a lot of uh, USB PC based spectrum analyzers. So underneath that is a, a little uh, PC and uh, uh, I have used I use a signal hound spectrum analyzer that goes to four and a half gigahertz directional antenna. So it's a good pop up solution for interference hunting. Obviously, the advantage is getting up above the terrain and getting up above the noise and and finding those signals has been very successful for me. 
Another solution is uh, using uh, GNU radio, which uh, yeah, but we're off, off one, I think, go back a slide, is using uh, GNU radio. Uh, maybe I added a slide that's not in there. So GNU radio is a uh, uh, open source software package, runs on Linux and uh, uses a SDR radio that's uh, quite compact. And with that, you can demodulate virtually everything. Uh, they, there are software uh, blocks that have been built by various people, universities and students and, and users around the world that, uh, that um, an example I have is uh, demodulating television, for example. You could pop in the air and, and yeah, you can see six megahertz wide, it must be TV, but now you can actually look at the TV station and know what it is. So that capability is small enough now to be put on a drone. And let's see what slide is next. Yeah, that one. So this one is working with Tim and OmniSig. Uh, let me just show you this. The uh, GPU is really just an NVIDIA Jetson, which is quite a small little PC or, or uh, uh, graphics processor unit that uh, can do the work that is needed to. The, the receiver is just a uh, software-defined radio like this uh, USRP. And the two together then would allow you to uh, to do what uh, Tim was recommending, but do it at 400 feet. And I think for uh, for spectrum monitoring, certainly at six gigahertz uh, for the uh, uh, issues with point-to-point -point microwave, you could easily pop up there and and uh, do a pretty good uh, evaluation of who who's out there and and uh, are they going to interfere with those point-to-point -point systems. And finally, isotropic uh, EMF surveys. This is an area that I think needs to be explored more. There are some new uh, EMF receivers out there that are quite portable. And uh, this is needed because the uh, small cell uh, 4G, 5G are now putting these signals down on the ground or closer to people. And it's not uncommon for people to wonder how much, uh, you can see that antenna in the middle there, how much signal is that uh, base station put into that window to the person sitting at the, at the office there. And without having to go into each office, you could pop a drone up in between, measure the level, and then extrapolate to what's going on inside the office, know if that person is being subjected to high field strength. So uh, I see this as a big opportunity. There's a fair bit of new equipment, and I'd like to like to get that in the air and, and find out uh, find out what we can do with it. So to summarize, uh, I see the acceptance of drones as a uh, altitude enhancing spectrum management system is, is completely being accepted. Uh, the movement to, away from Chinese drones is, is going very quickly. And I think the the advantage of using using a drone to do spectrum management is is proven now. I I, I see it uh, internationally as well as just as in the U.S. So with that, I'll open up for questions. I don't know if Tim the questions for Tim or or I or how do you want to do questions, but I'm open up for questions. I have something came in earlier in the video. Uh, high level sixty years was an urban demo, and there's this challenge of understanding if interference is coming in from six years from indoor units through over the windows, over the garage doors, mm -hmm. or just through glass. And there are also a whole lot of six years outdoor units. And there was a discussion earlier about how the FCC enforcement bureau can't be stressed to be a hundredfold increase in, in enforcement activity. So there needs to be some sort of level of, uh, of balance. How would drones help assess harmful interference? Let's say that band uh, and be useful, let's say, as a enforcement or with self policing by industry. Do you hear that, Joe? Or Tom, sorry. Yep, I did hear that. Uh, uh, Tim, what I guess I'll, I'll say is that uh, certainly. Uh, we've proven that the uh, hardware needed to support deep sig on a drone is is you know way within the weight limit, easy to fly. I think the choice would be what antenna you would use, but uh, 
that we could get that data into your system pretty easily. You want to talk about what you would do then to to support uh, the six gigahertz issue with DeepSig? Yeah, I think the general question was how can how can we use drones to help the FCC, for example, um, just simply monitor six gigahertz band interference, uh, whether it's coming in or out of a building. Um, I mean, uh, right, that, that's, that's kind of the general question that he had. Yeah. I mean, the, the harder part is what was mentioned is it's easy to pick the fixed stuff, right? The interference that's always on. What about stuff that's coming on for five minutes and then maybe the next day comes off, right? So, uh, so whether you have regular, I mean, for, for drones, right, you're moving these around. <laughs> you're going to do this on Monday or something, and that's when you're going to do your sweep, and you might miss something on Tuesday. So that's a much harder problem as opposed to having a, an in-place monitoring system or something on the actual device itself that's reporting that. Um, so it would be very good for detecting kind of fixed stuff that's always on um, uh, and, and maybe can catch some stuff that's intermittent. Um, but, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Tom, if you have any other. Well, the, tethered, the tethered drones can sit there for days. Uh, so you essentially have a pop-up 400-foot uh, tower to listen from. So, so taking that a step further, the directionality capabilities is because once you detect it, yeah. you've mapped it, yep. you directionality go and finding it, is that uh, a capabilities in the drone application to go and point it out and say, oh, well, that's happening in this building on the third floor? <laughs> Do you get that granularity of, of tracking? Well, you certainly, at 6 gigahertz, you could easily put a 10 dB or higher gain antenna, which would be, you know, which would give you the direction of the, uh, of the source of the signal. Um, and I suppose you can move the drone, continually move the drone to different positions and home in on it pretty quickly since you're up above the multipath. Right. That's a good way to do the single channel is just using energy and moving it around and, and you can get a good approximation. We've got another neural network, yes, to do DF also, but it requires multiple channels, which requires a little bit bigger SDR um, where you actually you will get a direction um, from it. So those technologies are out there, right? And I, I agree that would be a good combination with these um, to figure it out. Although, again, that's unique enough, uh, like platform enough where it's always moving, so you should be able to get a, just depends on how accurate you want, um, what you want it to be. Uh, Tim, on the uh, machine learning and the AI, mm -hmm. are you able to detect and, and discern specific harmonics from some specific signals? You wouldn't be able to, we would probably just end up classifying that as FM, <laughs> like an FM signal, right? So uh, we probably wouldn't be able to say just out of our stuff, this is associated with this emitter over here. That said, you know, uh, the output's JSON, it's streaming something. You could say, you could always be looking at uh, harmonic frequencies and being like, that's weird. This is like an exact harmonic of, of this. Um, so it could be an indicator that it's there. Um, uh, but it's not something, well, to be fair, we haven't tried to train it to do it, but um, this would be my guess of what, what would happen. We would out of the box classify as FM, and could we train it as a specific harmonic of something? Well, possibly, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm thinking narrowband signals in my head, first of all, when I'm thinking harmonics, but we, you know, we regularly see in low cost software defined radios aliasing, right? Um, uh, that that is like you know we're seeing LTE down at 200 megahertz when people are using this and they're like why is OmniSig classifying this as LTE? I was like well it's there you don't have any filters on that thing it's like you're sitting next to a high power base station, um, but in that sense we're, we're just calling it whatever the original signal is. Yeah. 